you could imagine a company thinking uh, maximizing shareholder value is basically what we want to do. And the best way to do that is to create an information cocoon. I'm Michael Barone, Resident Fellow at American Enterprise Institute, and I'm here today with Professor Cass Sunstein, University Professor at Harvard Law School, formerly Professor at the University of Chicago Law School for many years, uh, Director of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the um, Office of Management and Budget in the White House from 2009 to 2012 during the Obama administration. Professor Sunstein has written uh, more than a dozen books, or at least they've been, they've been published, and his latest is Hashtag Republic, uh, Divided Democracy in the Age of Social Media. So uh, Cass Sunstein has been at AEI and spoken and participated in a number of programs over many years. Uh, we welcome him here once again as a friend of AEI and a person from whom we learn. and. What's the message of your book, sir? Well, the basic message is that echo chambers and information cocoons are a real problem for democracy. It's very important for people to step outside a kind of hall of mirrors, which they can construct with the aid of Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, and encounter both topics that are uh, unfamiliar and maybe not especially interesting to them, and certainly points of view that aren't congenial and that may be disruptive to what they already think. That is uh, central to, uh, uh, let's say, the American project. Well, you talk uh, in the book about uh Bill Gates' vision in his, I believe, 1995 book, You Can Have a Me Environment. I don't know if Mr. Gates pointed out uh, to what some of the uh, downsides of that are that you're talking about. Uh, was this foreseen uh, 20 years ago? A, a bit, by some of the visionaries uh, of which uh, Mr. Gates is certainly one. So some people saw it 20 years ago, and they basically celebrated it. They thought that you're not going to have a, a network or you know, the Wall Street Journal anymore, that they were wrong in thinking we wouldn't have those things, but they were right in saying that their role would be very different. So what they foresaw was, instead of picking up the Wall Street Journal or instead of looking at the network, you would be able to construct what some people called the daily me, which meant a completely personalized uh, encounter with uh, the screen or with the um, with your computer or tablet, and that would mean that if you, you know, celebrated, let's say, uh, Senator Sanders, you could just have a Sanders world and see everything that reflected views that were congenial to him. Or if the only issue that interested you really was, let's say, what's happening with the budget. Now that would be a pretty unusual person whose only interest is the budget. But if that was your interest, you could just sort yourself into a world where it was budget, 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 budget. And the early view in 20 years ago, 15 years ago was, whoa, that's phenomenal. People can get exactly what they want. Do we have uh, metrics, numbers that tell us to what extent the world has changed uh, from that period in the mid-1990s when people were celebrating the me world? We do. And they suggest the most dramatic, I think, is the numbers showing what percentage of people get a lot of their news from their Facebook news feed. And it turns out that the number is quite substantial. It's, it's over 20 percent. It changes, of course, every month. And it's demographically um, inflected in the sense that young people tend to get a very significant proportion of their news from their Facebook news feed. We also have numbers about whether people on Twitter are um, uh, following points of view that are basically theirs and whether they are uh, cross-posting or interested in stuff that's different. We also get a sense from Facebook of the extent to which people are clicking on stuff that is uh, consistent with their current views or whether they are being algorithmed. I just invented a new word, algorithmed. A verb. You made it into a verb. <laughs> yes, I'm not so proud of that invention. Nonetheless, it is an invention. People have been algorithmed into material that is uh, creating an echo chamber. And the data is supportive of the view that there is some uh, algorithmization. Is there any movement back in the other direction? N not empirically. I think what could be said uh, to 
uh, challenge the echo chamber hypothesis is that there are a lot of people who, first, there are a lot of people who are curious and who are not sorting themselves into the daily me. A lot of people, you know, they may be Republicans, but they're kind of interested in what the Democrats are saying, either because they want to see what foolishness there is or because they think, you know, they, they may have something uh, helpful to say or uh, uh, informative to say. And Republicans and Democrats, there are a lot who are doing both of those things. So the existence of human curiosity is vindicated by the data that we see. And it's also the case that uh, it's challenging to defend the proposition that people are self-sorting more on the internet than they do with respect to, say, television or ordinary face-to-face. You get -face very thing. different uh, politically complected audiences for Fox News on the one hand, MSNBC on the other. Uh, that's been a phenomenon that's been apparent for at least a dozen years or more, am I right? Completely. And in the old days where people got their information from their newspaper, it might be that in the town you'd have one newspaper that had an identifiable perspective and another had a different one. So while the problem of echo chamber creation is really serious online, uh, it isn't uh, clearly wrong to say that it's historically just been with us and it's not worse than it was. I believe in certain ways it is worse than it was and the data supports that, but it's more important uh, on one view to say that it's a problem than to say that it's worse now than it was 60 years ago. Uh, let me suggest or try to put something in a historic perspective. We've been talking about the last 20 years, the last uh, 30 years, dozen years, but if we look at the longer run in American history, what you might say is that we had a period where we had sort of universal media because of technological development. And it was often, reg in the case of broadcast media, regulated media. In the movies, it was regulated by the Hayes Code uh, for a long period of time, internal uh, regulations. So from, let's say, the Radio Act of 1930, which started federal uh, uh, regulation of radio and then television, uh, to the abolition of, by the FCC of the Fairness Act, uh, something you argue was on balance a good thing. You had this sort of um, universal media that uh, appealed to everybody, three t you know, a couple radio networks, three television networks, a few movie studios. Um, it coincides with the period of the career of Ronald Reagan who made his living in the universal media of radio, movies, and television. Um, and that that's the exception. You go back to Jacksonian America, the, the, the George Washington administration, the Civil War. Uh, you have a much more partisan media. You have people seeking their partisan media. There's a book by a Smithsonian crea uh, curator John Greenspan called The Virgin Vote. It's about people made big celebrations of young men going to cast their first vote in, uh, and they've reached age 21. And they would remain partisans of their party, um, almost like uh, you know Steelers fans or Cowboys fans remain partisans of their teams. We lived for that uh, for a long time, not without some problems. Um, do you think there's some similarities that might be instructive between that period and this? You're making a great point. I think it is true that the period where the, as they're sometimes called, the general interest intermediaries kind of uh, rode high, whether it's a network or uh, the daily newspaper, was, is relatively narrow in the arc of uh, American history, and that the uh, current age has more similarities to what preceded it. Uh, than we normally think. And we got a civil war out of that, among other things. Yeah, yeah. I uh, hope we're not going to get that with this. But uh, what I'd say is, is different about this age than that age is the extreme ease with which you can find uh, a zillion like-minded people who will fortify the view that you're inclined toward. And in the pre-internet era, as in the pre-TV radio era, you could find a community of people, but the community either would be not that big or it would just have, by virtue of how geography works, a degree of diversity. Now, along some issues, 
you know, the, what's produced the Civil War, you might not find a whole lot of diversity in some areas of the South or the North on who's right. But on many questions that confronted the nation, to find yourself uh, communicating with a huge number of people who think exactly like you do, that's hard. With our current technology, you can do that uh, basically in less than a second. Less than a second. I mean, I'm thinking back the period of the 1850s. Very confusing to us election freaks because you get new parties, old parties disappearing, big changes. You get the agitation over the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the issue of slavery in the territories, the formation and response there too of the Republican Party. All within about six months, that happened. You have you know, Horace Greeley's New York Tribune being circulated around the northern parts of the country being suppressed by postmasters in the south. That moved faster than we think of. It, they didn't wait for mules to make their way across the country. I'll tell you kind of the beating heart of the concern of the book. Uh, in 2016, over 40,000 people died on America's roads. That's an increase over 2015, and that's an increase over 2014. Now, what are we going to do about that? Uh, our infrastructure in the United States for a country of this uh, capacity is, President Trump's completely right on that, it's highly problematic. Whatever you think about the immigration situation, uh, it, it's not ideal, and there are a number of things that could be done to improve it that, in principle, are, are just the right things to do. We have a number of poor people in the United States. It's, it's a lot lower than it could be, but who are struggling with a terrible educational system uh, that give their kids weak prospects. We don't have the level of intergenerational mobility that uh, we would like and that fits our official and uh, completely admirable creed, which is in America anyone can make it, whoever your parents are. That, the data doesn't suggest that's true. Now those are concrete problems, each of which has a potential solution. And the solution to each of them has been um, uh, rendered much more difficult by virtue of the kinds of polarization that social media are feeding. So if you think that the word regulation is like the word, what, uh, bet, where bet, it's alphabet, it's not bet. If you think the word regulation is short for job-killing regulation, then the idea of doing something about some of these issues would seem preposterous because a regulation is job-killing regulation. Or if you think the system is rigged so anything that hurts people who are wealthy is like a good idea, then you're not going to be making much progress. So the, the problem that I'm focused on is uh, premature death, uh, poor life prospects, uh, basic public goods that aren't um, being improved. Now, don't get me wrong, the United States is, is on balance doing fantastically by world standards and historical standards, but the, the echo chamber and information cocoon problem is a contributor to our inability to It's to impeding move rather than facilitating. Absolutely. Here, what are the solutions? In hashtag republic you advance, uh, some modest proposals, I think it's fair to say. Um, describe what, if anything, we can do. You don't talk about actual government regulation of the internet, as I no, read. No, I don't want that. So it's 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 this is not a cheerful book. So I did before this a book on Star Wars. That's a really happy book. This is a, this is a more downbeat book and. Uh, to identify the problem is the goal of the book, not to uh, press on, uh, hooray, we have solutions. And it's important to think that, to know that some problems just don't have solutions, or they don't have solutions that the identifier of the problem can see yet. Having said that, there are a few things we can do. So the providers of information, whether they are MSNBC or Fox News or Facebook, uh, can work in a way that counteracts rather than promotes uh, the problems we're describing now. And Facebook, to its credit, uh, from its public pronouncements, and they are immensely important in terms of democratic uh, governance now. They've become that. They are clearly rethinking uh, the core values described in their news feed in 2016, where in 2016 the idea was, we're going to give you what exactly interests you which is, seems beautiful, but it's the daily me. It's the, uh, 
uh, you're going to be algorithmed, basically. They are now rethinking that. Now, two ideas that would uh, be uh, on the, on the uh, list of proposals are, why not give Facebook users an opposing viewpoints button where they can just click and then their newsfeed is going to show them stuff that they don't agree with? Or why not give Facebook users a serendipity button where they can just click, and if they click, then they're going to get stuff that is just coming to them through an algorithm which provides people with a range of stuff. So if you're a, uh, you know, someone who's just focused on one set of issues, you're going to get the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times also. And Facebook, to its credit, doesn't want to pick winners and losers, so they shouldn't promote one particular newspaper, but they could have a random draw of, of things. Maybe it could be geographical. So those are two ideas that Facebook could use, and you can see analogies that uh, any provider of information to a large group of people provides. I've, you know, you're right to say that I've, I've had uh, 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 involvement with AI over the years, and one thing that AI does is there's a range of views at AEI and provided by AEI. And you can think of many organizations that have a uh, commitment to doing that, even if, in the case of Fox News or MSNBC, they kind of know who their people are. Well, you've, uh, one of the proposals that you advance as a voluntary proposal is that uh, people who are attacking or criticizing or taking opposite position from others on the internet might start off by saying, what's right? <laughs> about your opponent. You're sort of asking for manners. But isn't there a danger that uh, even if you give them a nudge, they won't budge? Yeah, definitely. So um, you could imagine a company thinking, and now we're talking about private sector entities, our first obligation is to our shareholders. And uh, maximizing shareholder value is basically what we want to do. And the best way to do that is to uh, create an information cocoon which makes people um, uh, cozy or inflamed or, or whatever. And uh, uh, maximizing share, I taught at the University of Chicago, as you mentioned, maximizing shareholder value is uh, uh, something that companies legitimately focus on. But the hope is that many providers of information, uh, A, think that there are more, more than one way to maximize shareholder value or maybe get close to that and also think that while maximizing shareholder value is a, uh, a priority, there are a few other things that we're interested in. And if you're Facebook, which is doing great, you might think maximizing shareholder value, yes. Being part of a self-governing society, also yes. And we're going to try to accomplish those. We're going to try to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, I want to thank you, Cass Sunstein, for sharing time with us here at AEI and uh, give another plug uh, for your book, Hashtag Republic. Uh, it is, what, your 13th, 14th, 15th book that you've published? There are too many. There are I, too many. I can't count that high. Okay. I was an English major. Okay, well, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you. I think less is probably more. What sensible. about an hour? What about an hour? What? It's a good topic, and the book is just so rich with detail. What about an hour and a half? I, I dispute that. <laughs>